Well, I first met uh, Phil Hunt, I think maybe two years ago or three years ago, when they were last here. And uh, they're originally from Merrimack, and so they come home every so often on furlough and have the chance to come and worship to, uh, with us together. And then we connected after service, and we realized that we follow each other on Twitter. And so uh, those of you know I'm on Twitter here and there, and so uh, we stayed connected the last couple of years and would share ideas and thoughts and talk to each other. And we have mutual friends and things like that, so just watching that ministry blossom from afar has been a blessing. Uh, but they're here now, and so just a, a way of introduction. Phil and his wife, Lori, uh, have served the church planning uh, ministry. They've been missionaries in Africa since 1992. In 1993, they were part of a, a church planting team that planted Faith Baptist Church in, of Riverside in Kitwe, Zambia. This church has been used by God to plant a number of other churches in the Kitwe area. Am I pronouncing that right, Kitwe? Is that right? All right. In 2015, they partnered with a new team to start Kitway Church, where Phil now serves as the pastor of preaching and vision. Phil's burden is to see the gospel advance in every village, town, and city in Africa through healthy reproducing local churches. His passion is to train the next generation of God-called leaders who will catch the same vision and advance in a truly indigenous church planting movement across Africa. In 2006, Central Africa Baptist College and Seminary was founded in Kitwe at Zambia, and Phil has served as the president there since its inception in 2006. Phil and Lori have, always, have also been involved in the founding of Faith Children's Village Orphanage in 2003. This ministry is now in the hands of a competent, godly Zambian leadership. He continues to serve on the uh, FCV Africa Board of Directors. He also serves as the Africa Director for IMB Global, an international missionary sending agency based in the USA. He and his wife, Lori, have seven children. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Cherith, Austin, Colin, Ashlyn, Carmen, Tamarin, and Corbin, and two of them are here with them today. Um, and just an exciting thing uh, for me to be able to hear about what's going on uh, in Zambia and to see uh, just the, the heart for number one, church planting. It's a heart that our church has as well. We want to be a church that plants churches. Uh, a heart for uh, training and, uh, and uh, seminary education and ministry and things like that. We want to be a church that trains up leaders as well. So uh, his, his heartbeat is, is also my heartbeat, and I trust our heartbeat together. Um, today he's going to be bringing a message to us from the scriptures. But I want to encourage you, after the service, about 10 minutes after, uh, we actually got this slide projector working for the first time in 10 years. So uh, he's going to be the first one to inaugurate this slide projector. Now, he's a, a, a presentation on what's going on in Africa. So um, I know there's a lot going on today, but please stick around after the service for just about a half hour and be able to listen to what's going on in Africa. I think it's good for our church to see things going on outside of our own borders and see what the Lord is doing in other parts of the world. And so please make sure you stick around for that. Without any further ado, I would welcome my friend Phil to bring forth the preaching of God's Word. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it, is, uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be able to be here with you uh, today. Um, my, my wife was born and raised in Atkinson, New Hampshire, so she's a Propshire, New Hampshireite. Is that what you say? Yeah. Um, I, I was born in Maine, in the city of Rockland, and uh, so all my, all my family are Mainers, and uh, so we have our roots firmly here in New England. So when we see things that God is doing in New England, this is a passion and a heartbeat for us. And so we rejoice with you at God's manifold mercy and grace in your lives and also in this place uh, to the glory of God. Amen. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to sharing with you this morning, but also after the service. I hope, I hope you'll stick around for just a few minutes. Um, I think it'll be uh, informative and uh, helpful. And uh, if I can cut my comments short uh, in, in the PowerPoint, I would love even to, to get some feedback and answer questions that you might have for that, uh, that uh, quick 30 minutes. So I hope you will stay. <clears throat> Take your Bible, please. And turn with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And we're going to be looking beginning in verse number 8. And I do want to speak to you this morning on this subject. Three unchanging foundational principles 
for modern missions. Three unchanging foundational principles for modern missions. When we think of the missionary work of the church, this is where we as a local church decide if we believe whether or not people without Christ are worth saving. Missions is where the church decides whether or not to rescue people who have who have all of their lives been enslaved, languishing in the dark chains of sin, those who have been in bondage to Satan all of their lives without hope in the world. My purpose in this message is to lay out for us this morning a theological foundation for missions and why you and I, as members of a local congregation, must be engaged in the mission of God. Why we should rearrange our, our personal and ministry priorities to take part in what God is doing through the, through the advance of the gospel, not only in Gilmanton, in the center of New Hampshire, but even to the ends of, of the earth. You understand that as we, as we gather this morning, there are an estimated 2.5 billion people around the world who have never heard of Jesus Christ. 2.5 billion. That's like 40% of the world's population. So I want us to look at our text, and, 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 and I want to urge you, and I want to exhort you that you must listen carefully to each word that I'm about to read to you from Romans chapter 15. Because there are three big ideas that we must understand and we must embrace. Failure to understand this truth means that in some sense we will also fail in our obedience to God and the result, from a human perspective, will be eternal eternally devastating for those who have not heard, heard of Christ. Notice please in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 8. So in this, this treatise by the Apostle Paul of justification by faith, as he, is, as he is wrapping up and into the application section, what must we do about this wonderful truth that we are justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ? Having been recipients of that faith, what is the church at Rome? What are we as the people of God to now do? What should we be motivated to do in response to this glorious reality of our justification? Romans 15 verse 8, he says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, the, the Hebrew people, the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, all the way back there in the, in the, early, the early sections of the, of the Old Testament, to confirm those promises, that's, that's one reason that, that, that Christ came, but, but also in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And then, and then Paul, Paul argues from the Old Testament, for it is written... Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Romans, uh, Psalms 18, 49, and also 2 Samuel 22 uh, and verse 50, this quotation. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That, that's a quote from Deuteronomy 32. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come and he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles 
in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Father, we have read this text, and we ask that you, the Holy Spirit of God, who inspired the Apostle Paul to pen these words, would now meet with us in this text to open to us the understanding of what Paul has, has written and also to apply these truths to each one of us who know you as Lord and Savior. I pray that you do your work of grace, continue to do your work of grace in us so that you may do your work of grace through us as we go with this glorious gospel of justification by faith in Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Three foundational, unchanging, foundational principles for modern missions. So in our text, Paul here sets out three missions truths that you must believe and you must embrace. In other words, what we are, what we are going to look at and study must become, become so much a part of us, so real to us, that it literally becomes part of our spiritual DNA. We believe it, not just intellectually, but we believe it in faith. Therefore, we act upon these these truths. We must believe and embrace if we are to fulfill our mandate of reaching our generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so three truths. I want to show them to you, all right? Here, here's principle number one. Look, look at verse, look, go back to verse number eight. Here, here's the first, here's the first uh, truth. The mission is unchanged. The mission is unchanged. No, notice what Paul says in verse number eight. He points out the fact in verse number 8 that this mission that he, is, that he is sending us on, this mission that we are called to, this mission begins with God. Look at verse, verse 8. He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that's the Jewish people, to show God's truthfulness, and in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles, that's, that's everyone else, right? That, that's that's the, all of the unbelievers, those who have never believed in Jesus, the pagans, the nations, the non-Jews, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So this mission is unchanged. This mission begins with God. Now, Let's define some terms for us, uh, for ourselves this morning, so that, so that as we, we use these terms, we are thinking about the same thing. What, what, what is the mission? What is the mission of God? And I would suggest that the mission of God is the work of God in reconciling sinful human beings to himself. That is God's mission. This mission originated with God the Father, this mission was enacted by Jesus Christ in his incarnation. This mission centers in Jesus Christ. Acts 1.8, we, we know that the Holy Spirit empowers this mission. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So it originates with God. It is enacted through Jesus Christ. It is empowered by the Holy Spirit. But then we learn it is the church that carries out the mission. 
It is the church that carries out the mission. The Great Commission, we think of Matthew 28, for instance, is given to the church, and then the world receives the mission. So this mission is unchanged. The mission begins with God. So, so the, the, the mission of God, the work of God in reconciling sinful human beings to himself. Now, what then is missions? When you add an S to that word, right? Missions. What is missions? I would suggest this definition. Missions is the plan of committed believers to accomplish the mission of God. And whatever else may be involved, that plan to carry out God's mission centers in the verbal proclamation of the gospel. And everything else that, that we may do serves this central purpose. And so I would suggest that we must see a difference between ministries of mercy and the mission of the church. Ministries of mercy demonstrate the love of God and open opportunities for the gospel. However, ministries of mercy alone are not the gospel, nor do they bring saving faith to the lost. Listen, you can come to Africa and you can drink, drill lots of wells in lots of villages and you can even do it in the name of Jesus, but those people will still die lost in their sins and spend eternity in the lake of fire. Digging wells is not missions. Now, it can serve the mission. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm, don't, don't throw tomatoes or anything else at me this morning. That there, are many, there are many things that in our compassion as the children of God that we can and should engage in. Right? I heard of one this morning. Praise God for the, for the, for the bottles. Right? For the, the, the wonderful thing. We ought to be involved in those kind of things. And yet we need to see a difference between fulfilling the mission that God gave us to do and ministries of mercy that we may be engaged with. Okay, so this mission um, begins with God. We said it's unchanging. It begins with God. But there's a second, there's a second thing there, and, and I think you see it in verse 9 through 12. This mission, though it begins with God, it extends to all peoples. Did you see that in verse 9? And in order that, Jesus came, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. You see, someone who knows God must go and tell them about Christ and his sacrifice. Somebody must go and live out the implications of the gospel in front of them. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is what Paul draws the, uh, from Old Testament text to prove. I mean, look at, what, look at what's happening here in, in verse in verse number 9, he quotes from the Psalms, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. So, so what's happening here? Um, Gentiles, these are non-Christians, right, in our, in our application, but in, in that day it was, it was non-Jews, those who believed in and worshipped pagan gods, false gods. And he says, here's what happens. Gentiles hear of God and witness worship. I will praise you among the Gentiles. Right? Listen. Do you understand that, that unbelievers who show up at Harvest Bible Church cannot worship? They can't worship. They, they can sing the songs. They might even know the songs. But they can't worship. Unbelievers can't worship. So what happens? Unbelievers show up on a Sunday here... And I'm telling you what they're doing. They have no capacity for worship because their heart is, is dead in trespasses and sin. But they are watching you worship. That's what's happening. So as we, as we stand and as we sing and as we pray, as we, as we interact in fellowship with one another, these unbelievers are watching us worship and they're making a determination. I mean, they're, they're saying to themselves, look, I'm not, even, I'm not even sure about this whole God Christianity thing myself. I'm not even sure that's... that's gen but they're watching us worship. They're watching you worship. And th what, what they're trying to determine is, do you really believe it? 
They ought to be able to leave on a Sunday morning saying, hey, I'm still not sure about this whole gospel God Jesus thing, but I'll tell you what, those people believe it. Did you hear the way they sang? Did you see the expressions of their, on their faith as they just opened their mouth and just praised God from the bottom of their heart? I'm not sure if I believe it, but I'll tell you what, there's a group over there, they believe it. That's what's happening in verse, in verse number 9. Now notice what happens. There's a, there's a transition here that's taking place. Notice in verse number 10, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. This is worship that is influenced by the, by the, by the, by the believing Jews. And Gentiles now join in and participate with Israel in the worship of the one and only true God. I would suggest that we witness by the way we worship. And then verse 11 and 12, you see, you see a demonstration or an indication of indigenous worship of God. Do you see what happens here? Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. So they come, they're watching the Jews worship. They're, they're present, they're listening. And then they join in because their hearts have been regenerate. They join in in the worship. And then the Gentiles are just reflecting the glory of God in the context of their own culture. The indigenous, spontaneous, indigenous, appropriate, God-glorifying worship of God. And guess what? Worship in Africa doesn't look and sound exactly like it does in Gilmanton. And that's okay. That, that's what's happening here. right? Indigenous worship of God. As they mature and they begin to develop in their faith, they, they discover and apply a cult, culturally appropriate expressions of heart worship towards God. So we said there's three. Three unchanging foundational principles for modern missions. Number one is the mission of God is unchanged. Notice the second one, verse 13. The power is unchanged. Look at verse 13 and 14. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, now, remember who he's talking to, right? These are, these are former idolatrous, pagan, God-rejectors, right? Th these are people, I mean, you've heard of the Greco-Roman gods, Greek mythology, Roman mythology. Just go and, and read about the kind of gods that these, these people worshipped. I mean, imagine... A, a, a system of worship in which you are taught that the way you enter into intimacy with God is by joining yourself to a temple prostitute as an act of worship. Epaphrodites, right? Temple of Epaphrodites. What about the temple of Bacchus? The god of wine. So you go and, 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 and a drunken party in the, in the temple of your God and you eat and you drink until you cannot hold any more and then you go to that, that stone pit in the center of the temple and you regurgitate into the, into the hole at the center of the temple so that you can go back and drink and drink and drink and drink again. That was worship. And to those former pagans who had participated in that kind of lifestyle and worship and belief system, notice what he says to them. I am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of moral goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. What is the mission? The mission is unchanged. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ amongst the nations. And the power for that mission is unchanged. This is a power that radically transforms a person. Right? This, this Holy Spirit imparts faith in the Word of God, verse 13. This is the hope to turn from their past life by faith and to offer themselves to God for an eternal future and hope. That is the power of the gospel. And that power is unchanged. You see three evidences of this, of this grace. 
No, notice again in verse number 14, just to point them, point them out to you. N- notice, notice that these new believers are among a formerly unreached people, and Paul says to them, you are full of goodness. That word goodness speaks of moral goodness. So he's talking to people who at one time lived promiscuous, sexually immoral, debauched lives. And now he's looking at those same people who a few months ago, a year ago, were living like that. And he says to them in verse 14, I am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of moral goodness. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit applying the gospel to these pagan people. Notice notice the second evidence of grace. He says says in verse number 14, and not only that, but you are also filled with all knowledge. In other words, these, these former pagan people, these new believers have a genuine comprehension of the Christian faith. To the the church at Corinth, Paul had said, um, uh, Know you not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor abusers themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, and such were some of you, but you have been washed. You, you have been sanctified. You have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So, so this evidence of grace, they, they are full of moral goodness. What a transformation. They are also full of knowledge, knowledge, a genuine comprehension of the Christian faith. And notice he says, and these new believers have the Holy Spirit given ability to admonish one another, to counsel one another from the scriptures. Look what he says. End of verse 14. You, that you are full of all goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. This is, this, beloved, this is spiritual maturity. New believers effectively ministering by the grace of God. So the, 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 the mission is unchanged. The power is unchanged. This is a power that radically transforms lives. And this is a power that enables bold, courageous proclamation of the gospel. And you see that in verse 16. He says, to be a, he says um, uh, I'm reminding you of the grace God gave to me to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. Verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, 1,200 miles, this whole, this whole region, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. You see, this power, this unchanging power, enables bold, courageous proclamation of the gospel. The power of the Holy Spirit is manifested through bold witness. You find that in the book of Acts, right? People get all hung up with, with the, the tongues, that, the, the, the languages that are spoken in the, in, the, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 2. You get all hung up on that. But, but do you know the manifestation of the power is that the Holy Spirit would come upon those, when He came upon those believers, what was the result? Every single bold proclamation of the gospel. They boldly proclaimed the gospel. They were thrown in prison. They were let loose. They boldly proclaimed the gospel. And God does this for these new converts in these nations that have never before known of Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is manifested in bold witness. The power of the Holy Spirit is manifested by courageous commitment to the Great Commission. I'll uh, I'll show you a picture of this brother uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, his name is Muhammad, Muhammad Ismail. 
Muhammad was, is from Darfur. So if you went on the Joshua Project and you looked at the least reached places in the world, Darfur is, I think, in the top five. He's from Darfur. He's a Muslim scholar. He went to university in South Sudan, and someone in university, he was studying English, English literature. That was his degree in, in university, right? So someone gave him a Bible. And when they gave him a Bible, and Muhammad told me, he said, when, when, when I actually reached out and took that Bible, he said, I felt nausea. I was sick to my stomach. Because I've been told my whole life that that was a bad book. It was an evil book. You shouldn't even touch it. So he asked the guy, he said, he said is, this, is, this, is this full of lies? And the brother says, no, it's the truth. Read it for yourself. And so he began to read the Bible. Week after week. For several months, he read the Bible, and he believed in Jesus, and his life was transformed. So this, this, this Muslim scholar, training in South Sudan, gets saved, and immediately goes out, and he starts telling people about Jesus. Life transformed by the gospel. I got a phone call one day from somebody in South Sudan, and said, we got this guy up here, and and." By all indications, he's genuinely been converted. He's like starting a Bible study. He's preaching to everyone, but he doesn't know much. Is there any way that you guys could have him come down to CABU and train for ministry? Well, like, absolutely. And so Muhammad came to CABU, spent five years. In January this year, Faith Baptist Church of Riverside, which was the first church that we planted, um, Pastor Chopo Mwanza and the elders of the church had an ordination service and they ordained Muhammad as an elder of Faith Baptist Church of Riverside in Quito, Zambia. I was part of that ordination. Faith Riverside invited Quito Church to partner in missions together to send Muhammad to Khartoum in the Sudan to plant a church. So in February, Muhammad moved to Khartoum, Sudan. Four weeks ago, and I'll show you the photo. Four weeks ago, Muhammad baptized the first six converts in the Nile River. You say, what happened with that? It's the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit to change lives. And that power has never changed. Look at your own story. Look at your own life. Look at your own testimony. You are a testimony of the life-changing power of God. Whether you were born into a Christian family or you came to Jesus later in your life, it is a testimony to the power of the gospel. The power is unchanged. There's a last thing. Notice, please, if you would, in verse 19 through 24. So so the, the, the mission is unchanged, the power is unchanged, and the method is unchanged. Notice verse 19. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition... To preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I've been so often hindered in coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I've longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my way there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. So the mission is unchanged. The power for that mission is unchanged. And the method is unchanged. Here, here's what it is, folks. God uses people. Simple as that. God uses people. Notice Paul says in verse number 24, he has fulfilled his his. 
his uh, pioneer work of, of planting um, strategic churches in this whole region from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. And, and, and because God had called Paul not to build on someone else's foundation. See, that was a Timothy work. That was Titus' work. That was Barnabas' work. But, but Paul's job was to, to go into new places where people had never heard the gospel and to, and to establish beachheads for the gospel. So he's making plans now to travel to Rome and from Rome travel to the next frontier, which in that, at that point was Spain. You see, God uses people. I will go to Spain, he says, the next unreached area. Do, do you know that that 30% of, of people in Africa live in unreached areas? Do you know that, that, that in Africa there are 987 unreached people groups? Ethno-linguistic peoples living in a particular region and there is no biblical church that's, that's seeking to reach them with the gospel. That's an estimated 380 million people. Not just lost people. I mean, there's a lot more lost people. But these are 380 million people who have never, ever heard of Jesus. They've never heard the gospel. And no one is going. So how will they hear? Well, guess what? God's method has never changed. God uses people. God uses ordinary people. People like you and me. I mean, verse verse 16, Paul says that he is a minister of Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel. This is the same Apostle Paul that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9 acknowledged that he was the least of the apostles and didn't even feel like he should be called an apostle because he had been a persecutor of the church. But the power of the gospel had shined upon him and the power of the Holy Spirit had worked in his heart and transformed him from Saul the persecutor to the apostle Paul. The method is unchanged. God uses people. God uses ordinary people like you and me. The God who ordained the means, redemption through Jesus Christ, and the message, the salvation that is offered through faith in Jesus Christ, also ordains the method that this mission is carried out. And that method is missionaries. You see, someone has written, whenever God sets about to do a monumental task, he always taps someone on the shoulder and says... I want you. I mean, think about it. To preserve a godly line in the time of global judgment, God called on Noah. To call his people back to holiness, God sent an army of bold prophets. To deliver Israel from a plot to wipe out the Jews, God called a young princess named Esther. To rally his people and rebuild Jerusalem, God called Nehemiah. To bring the gospel of salvation to a needy world, God enlisted a teenage virgin and a leathery leathery desert-dwelling prophet and a band of 12 unknown tradesmen. And to spread that gospel to the ends of the earth, God tapped this guy, a zealous Pharisee by the name of Saul of Tarsus, who he transformed into the Apostle Paul. You see, God is a God who teams up with people. You and me. Not because he needs us. But because he chooses to use us. What grace. That the God who needs nothing and will fulfill his mission has chosen to fulfill his mission through people. Then what grace when he taps you on the shoulder and says, I want you in Gilmanton and I want you in Quito, Zambia. And you might be saying right now, I know what some of you people are saying. Oh, Pastor Phil, God wouldn't want me. 
I mean, you don't understand my story. You don't know my fears. You don't know my past failures, my personal shortcomings and inadequacies. God would never want me. And if that's what you're thinking this morning, you're in good company. Think about the people in Scripture that God used. Someone put this list together. Moses stuttered. David's armor didn't fit. John Mark was rejected by Paul. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. The only training that Amos had was the school of fig tree pruning because he was a farmer, fig farmer. Solomon was too rich. Abraham was too old. David was too young. Timothy had ulcers. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. John was self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer. So was Moses. Jonah ran from God. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burned out. Martha was a worrywart. And Noah got drunk. And this is exactly what Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians. Chapter number 1. In his words to the, to the church at Corinth, when he says, Consider your calling, brothers, verse 26, that not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, God uses people. He uses common, ordinary people to carry out his mission, just like you and me. But I want to remind you that God uses equipped people. God uses equipped people. People that he equips with his power and with his presence. Isn't that what he said to those those fearful disciples after the resurrection? He tells them to go, and what does he say? And I will be with you to the end of the age. You see, God is not dependent upon better methods or more machinery or more money, God is looking for a man who will represent him in this world. The person, the man, a man through whom God will enact his plan. The man is the plan. You see, God calls and the church sends missionaries cross-culturally to lay foundations like the Apostle Paul did. Missions lays foundations for reproducing healthy churches. Churches with trained leadership that are left behind to build upon that foundation and to reach out to the unreached areas around them. This was Paul's strategy. This is why he said from from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel. I have laid foundations of healthy reproducing churches and now those healthy reproducing churches in those centers are going to just, are going to reproduce themselves in their community. They're going to reach further and further out until that whole region has been reached with the gospel. Three unchanging foundational principles for modern missions. The mission is unchanged. The power for that mission is unchanged, and the method is unchanged. So I want to conclude by asking you two questions. Have you responded to the gospel by believing? Paul was convinced that these former pagans had, but have you? I'm not asking if you you attend church. I'm not asking if you're a nice guy. I'm saying, have you felt the weight 
and the conviction of your guilt and your sin before a holy God. Have you responded to the gospel by placing your faith, by believing in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness and deliverance of your sins? And if you'd say, Pastor Phil, you know, that one, that one I've just, that's been bothering me. I've been struggling with that one. I'm uncertain. Come and see one of us today. Let's talk about it. Let's look at scriptures together. Have you responded to the gospel by believing? And, and if your answer is a quick, well, yes, I have. Then I want to ask you this question. Have you responded to the gospel by obeying? Will you present yourself to God to ask Him to reveal to you if you are satisfactorily engaged in His mission right where you are? Would you ask Him, God, do you have something else for me? Those two questions. Have you responded to the gospel by believing and have you responded to the gospel by obeying? Friends, the church is not a cruise ship designed to bring you comfortably and safely to heaven. It is a battleship storming the gates of hell to deliver those who have all of their lives been in bondage to sin and to Satan. Friends, that is our mission. And Father, I pray that we might be empowered by your Holy Spirit to be faithful to that mission, both here in our own circle of influence, in our own communities, in the places that you have sovereignly and strategically placed us as your, as your followers. And also, Lord, to the regions beyond, to recognize that this morning as we enjoy the gospel proclamation and as we open Bibles that there are there are literally billions of people around the world who have not yet heard of Jesus for the first time. That you might use us, use this church to be a, 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 a blinding light of the gospel in this region. And that the light will shine so brightly here and transformed lives will be, be so evident here that that light might reach from here to the least reached places around the world. We thank you that, that the mission is unchanged, the power for that mission is unchanged, and the method that you have chosen to carry out that mission is unchanged. May we have a proper heart response to the gospel, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.